Video recordings of this podcast can be found on RaisingEquity.org and Raising Equity on YouTube. Welcome to Raising Equity. Today we have with us an activist and entrepreneur who happens to be in St. Louis for the fifth anniversary of Mike Brown's death. We have Brandon Anderson, who is based in Oakland, but is here with us to talk about his activism and how he has decided to contribute to ending police violence, to ending policing. And so today I want to welcome Brandon Anderson. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that you're in town for the fifth anniversary. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got connected to St. Louis and to this. It's homegrown St. Louis. It's brought you here, right? Yes. Yes. And before I got connected to homegrown St. Louis, I was connected to St. Louis because I was uh, like uh, most of every other person uh either witnessed or saw on the news a black man being gunned down in the street by a police officer with his hands up. And that was in 2014. And I was, uh, I was, I think I was a junior in college. Really? And I was at Georgetown, which is a predominantly white institution. And while I think they did a good job of teaching me about racism uh, they didn't teach me about um, what to do about racism. Mm. And when I left Georgetown, I took a hiatus for about six months and came here. Really? Yeah. I came here for several months and met with activists. And this was me just starting out. Um, so I was kind of taken under the wing by, uh, by many people, um, mostly black women here uh, in St. Louis, who taught me a bunch about what to do about racism in policing. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So at being at a Jesuit institution, they often are willing to talk about issues of social justice. Yeah. Uh, but like you said, we sometimes leave it at that. Yeah. And don't talk about the solutions. Yeah, it's hard because the solution is complex, right? Right. And, and, um, and so it's funny because I had one... When I made it, I live in Oakland now, and I was in the back of a lift on my way to work, and this woman picks me up. This was my introduction to Oakland, right? It was probably about a couple of weeks after I had been there. And she says, uh, you know, she had to be maybe in her late 40s, early 50s, and she was asking me a question. She just asked where I went to school. I said, Georgetown. And she said, oh, what did you study? Uh, and I said, well, I studied sociology, but my focus was on um, policing. And she said, oh, wow, that's really interesting that the same institutions that oppress us are the same institutions that are teaching us. Um, and, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm in Oakland. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> yes. I'm in Oakland. <laughs> yes, you are in Oakland with its deep, deep history. Yeah, yeah. And it feels like a pretty broad understanding of not just police violence, but of of racism and its systemic nature, which is different than St. Louis. So what Mike Brown did for St. Louis is it allowed us to name racism mm -hmm. in a way that, like I can walk into a room and be talking about racism as a system of oppression. And five years ago, I would have to walk folks through a series of, of examples and, you know, you know, dipped a toe in the water and, and yeah. then get to the fact that it's yeah. systemic. Whereas now it's becoming more of a common understanding. And, and to be fair, um, you know, St. Louis is one of those cities that thinks of itself as so philanthropic because we have so many Catholic institutions that are focused on giving and philanthropy. Um, and so if you aren't taught, like you said, in school or at some place that racism isn't just about mean people. Yeah. That it's about a system. Yeah, they they didn't have the tools to understand that this police violence was racism. It wasn't one bad apple, and that it really is a rotten system. Yeah, yeah. It. I think that that is probably the best conversation that any of us can have is to differentiate between are these officers bad people, and the difference between that and our officers who are part of an institution uh, continuing the bad activities of the state. Right? Yeah. So maybe let's pause just to say, 
you, it's not just an opinion that you have here, right? Like you have literally built a tool for individuals to track and map yeah. police conduct. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, I'd love to just kind of share my journey and Please. how we, how I kind of fumbled on this. It definitely started um, some years prior to um, witnessing the killing of Michael Brown, but uh, I was in the army. Um, well, let me back up and just kind of talk even before that. I was born to um, uh, my grandfather, right? My grandfather was one of the very first African-American men to own a nightclub in the heart of Oklahoma City, mm. right? And uh, he experienced police harassment for uh, lots of different things. And uh, my mom tells me the way he was harassed was, uh, for example, he didn't have, or his liquor license would end at midnight. And so the cops would be there at 1201, mm -hmm. right? And that this had become so frequent with his patrons, with the customers who had frequented his business, that he ended up closing his doors. I was born to his daughter, my mother, who in the early uh, 1990s, um, was uh, sort of charged with a paraphernalia charge. My mom tells me about a story of a police officer planting drugs on her because she didn't go to jail long enough for him, right? Uh, she had become addicted to crack in jail. She lost her rights to me um, some years later. Uh, I was born in Oklahoma, all right, where in 1921, the race massacre happened, where a young boy tripped over the foot of a white woman who was an ele elevator operator, and she cried rape. And uh, they looked for that boy for days. Weeks went by, they didn't find him, and they ended up burning down that city, Black Wall Street, which was, at the time, the wealthiest African-American community uh, in the United States of America. Uh, the National Guard made Black people uh, take up uh, positions in uh, the fairgrounds. So they herded Black people to the fairground and, um, and then made those people clean up the debris of uh, that massacre. Right? I didn't know that detail. Yeah. I didn't there know. There should be a movie about that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know really that they were be. made to clean up. Yeah. So before mm. I was <laughs> before I was old enough to understand who police were, I knew who they were to my grandfather, who they were to my mother, and who they were to the black people in my community. And so in 2007, uh, I lost someone really important to me, right? Um, and they had become important to me because they had practically done everything with me. I met this person uh, when I was in the third grade, right? And I fell in love for the very first time uh, when I was 15 years old, right? To this tall, skinny, big-headed Black boy who I first met in third grade English class. Mm. And falling in love with him was like falling asleep in class. You know, it's something you didn't mean to do, but you just did. And I tell you that I love carried us through just about everything. I got kicked out of my house uh, when I was in, uh, when I was living in Oklahoma because I was took took a BB gun to school trying to be cool, and uh, he ran away with me. Uh, and we lived homeless for two and a half years in an abandoned house on the corner of 36 and Coltrane, if anybody from Oklahoma is listening. And um, you were in high school. And I was in high school. Um, next, and, and, and it was that place that I fell in love, in an abandoned house that somebody left next to a used car lot that no one visited. And it's amazing the places we find the greatest strength. And I learned then that I was connected with him. Five years later, he proposed to me in 2006. And it was the happiest day of my life, mm. right? Because you don't hear about, like I grew up in Oklahoma. I didn't mm -hmm. hear about people 
you know, getting married mm-hmm. to their high school sweetheart, right? You only hear that in like romantic comedies or something. And uh, unfortunately, one year later after he proposed, I was in the army and um, I got a call from a friend of ours who said he'd been shot and killed. Um, in 2007, I lost my life partner and very best friend to police violence. His love was radical, unapologetic, and it changed my life. Mm. I so appreciate you sharing that. Because I think that people only th- only think about police violence as being the the like the moments that we see now on Twitter or Facebook or and that the the story that you tell is that it's generational. Yeah. That this problem of police violence isn't just about rooting out one bad police officer. It's about thinking about the the system of policing that we have in our society and the disproportionality. Mm-hmm. And as a black man, like the intersectionality of of sexual orientation and gender and race. I was learning this past June, just doing some reading around Stonewall and understanding mm. um and realizing that it wasn't just that police were targeting gay bars, right? It was that uh, the state mm-hmm. was refusing to give the liquor license right. so that the police then had permission mm-hmm. to target the bars. And so in similar ways, I just, I, I, I feel the connection of like, we have to understand how deeply these problems are rooted. Yeah. That yes, every life matters. Mm-hmm. And we need to say the names of people who are impacted, but we're all impacted. Communities are impacted. Families are impacted. Yeah. And I I think we get lost sometimes in counting the numbers of people who have been killed by police as a means of demonstrating how, um, just how traumatic police policing and police violence is. And oftentimes you see this, so a good friend of mine, Samuel Sinangwe, uh, founded MappingPoliceViolence.org, mm-hmm. did a really good job of articulating the disproportionate impact of police violence and what it has when Black people are killed in this country at a disproportionate rate, three times the rate, in fact, he found. Uh, shortly after that, you saw um, the counted by the Guardian be put up when they started to count the lives of people who had been lost to police violence. And then the Washington Post has taken it on as well. And I think that this is great that we're now counting the number of people who have been killed, but police violence, quite frankly, does not end there, right? And I, I tell the story about the loss of my partner because it's, it, it, it is important to acknowledge, uh, and not just the loss of my partner, but also what my mother lost, what my grandfather lost, right? My grandfather did not die, but he eventually closed the doors of his business turned to alcoholism and later was incapable of caring for his family, right? Uh, and so there are, you know, there are things that we need to keep into consideration. And right now, the way that when people report to us about the experiences that they're having with police, I want us to be really careful in not thinking uh, and not only believing that police violence impacts us from the sake of how many people we lose, right? And so I just want to break down really quickly the way police violence has become and is currently, in my mind, needs to be articulated as domestic terrorism and the four ways by which that domestic terrorism through police violence is articulated and manifests. The first is physical violence. And many people would say, we know that this happens. We know this from the highest level. That's the Counted or Washington Post or Mapping Police Violence, where they track the number of people who are killed, right? Uh, Somewhere between 6 to 10% of all homicides committed in the United States are committed by police, right? Uh, There are some 77,000 people who are injured on an annual basis just through their contact with police. Second is the way that police violence is economically abusive, right? So a really good example is in 2015, the Department of Justice investigated Ferguson. And what they found was that 25% of court revenue in the city was being leveraged off the backs of black and brown communities 
through speeding tickets, parking, and 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 other fines of that nature. Mm-hmm. Right? And with in St. Louis, it's exacerbated by the fact that we have so many municipalities, mm. so many very small municipalities that are really depending on that revenue for their yeah. livelihood. And so at that point, what had happened was the city in and of itself, uh, the mayor and the police chief said, we need you to increase the number of quotas that you bring in at that time to compensate for 7% reduction in taxes that had happened the year prior, right? The third way that police violence shows its ugly head is through neglect. A clear example of this is if you call police and you need them for some reason, because we, they've made us now depend on them for multiple reasons, um, uh, it takes them 40 minutes to show up, right? I, I live in Oakland, and on 12th and Broadway, a woman had reported to our system that she called police because a white nationalist, a self-proclaimed white nationalist, had uh, started to harass a mother in front of her. And she called the police. You know, the police said, they said, we're too busy, is what they said, right? Uh, You also have procedural neglect. So a woman had her house ran through by a SWAT team chasing after another person. So she lived six weeks without a front door and her backyard trampled. She filed report after report and nothing ever happened. So it's also the neglect good form of neglect is also putting Freddie Gray in the back of a paddy wagon and driving across West Baltimore to the police station and severing his spine two two days later, watching him die, right? And the last is psychological terror. After all of that happens, after physical violence happens, after economic abuse happens, after the neglect of resource-deprived communities happens, what that tells us is that once all of that happens and nothing ever is, ha- is, is no one in that is ever held to account for the, cur- for the current problems being perpetuated in the communities, is that the lives of people and the people who are left to deal with that trauma are not worthy of care and are not worthy of trauma, uh, you know, are not worthy uh, and are only worthy of trauma, excuse me. Uh, and therefore, what that does to our psyche is to teach us and to and over and over again to have reflected back to us by the television, by movies, by the world that the lives of people with dark skin and people with whom live with disabilities, because last year, 50% of all people who were killed by police were living with the disabilities. So people in vulnerable communities, resource deprived communities on the margins, their lives don't matter. And that's what we see in terms of the patterns, like you said. And that that point, though, at the end that you made around the devaluing of lives and humanity, as a psychologist, that's where I, I like to hang out, not in the yeah. devaluing, but in the fact that I feel like what is emerging and what has emerged in the past five to seven years, I think it was emerging before Mike Brown, actually out in the Bay in that area, is a a real practice towards honoring the dignity and humanity and those who are at the margins. Yeah. And I mean, I think about the work of Adrienne Marie Brown Mm. and other folks like and generative somatics. Like Mm. it's all about realizing that we have inherent dignity. Yeah. And the community health network as well talks about defying the lie, defying the lie of the myth of inferiority. Yeah. And that our work in our generation is to defy the lie that is perpetrated by all of those methods of violence and then some, right? Like I think about my parents had, you know, Nina Simone to be young, gifted and black and um, I'm black and I'm proud. I, I, I feel like that, that defying the lie and making sure that regardless of the conditions that we are aware of our inherent dignity and our worth and that we relate to each other in a way. Like I think about Adrian's work in terms of that the local is global and that if we can locally practice seeing each other, honoring each other, that not that it, not that we don't still then work to dismantle those systems of oppression, but that in our interactions, we can embody what we know we deserve. Yeah. And that's, that is such an ongoing practice. Oh, it is. That is a daily practice that is uh, something that, 
I'm sure many of us practice, but it is really hard, right? When the rest of the world is telling you that you aren't, yes, uh, you have to say I am, right? And that that's tough, but it's it. You're right. It's 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 incredibly important. I think I think that what I found throughout all of that is how that impacted me personally mm. as I went on to develop and be in, in, and try to engage in other intimate, meaningful relationships with other Black men, mm. right? So just I don't want to just have us understand how complex that might be. You have one Black man, you have a Black person, frankly, who the world has told should not understand themselves as being worthy of care and service, protection, and love, right? And so when you're in a relationship and you're engaging in a relationship with another Black person, you have to combat that in a way where they understand their worthiness, right? And you have to help to facilitate that themselves, right? They themselves have to be doing that work. But you have to, when you come to the relationship, that's that's stuff that you're running up against that precludes you from building in a way that is meaningful. But you also have to do that for yourself. Yes. So here I am in a relationship at um, you know, since then, trying to engage in a relationship with people who who have been told are unworthy of my love. And I'm also being aware that. The love that person is sharing and giving to me, I am unworthy of. And so on a daily basis, if what is being told to me is that the love I'm giving is you aren't worthy of, mm -hmm. and the love I'm receiving, I'm not worthy of, what, you, what, what happens when you see... Um, this is my favorite time of the year because I get to see black people get married and it's phenomenal <laughs> because like, I don't think that we truly understand the significance of black people being in love, Absolutely, which can be and is the best social political activity one could ever do to fight against the system mm -hmm. is to love each other. Mm -hmm. And to do that out loud mm -hmm. teaches the world it's okay. And so when I see that, it is for me remarkably different than protesting on the street. It's not to say that that isn't important, but I'd say that when it comes to fighting all of this, it's something we cannot do without that love. The love is yeah. essential. Yeah, yeah, we don't have movement without love and without relationship. Yeah, I mean that's a it's a good segue because I was going to ask. You know, everyone finds their place in movement and finds their way to contribute. Uh, that it doesn't always have to look like protesting in the streets. It doesn't always have to look the same. Yeah. And so this this database, Rahim, seems yeah. to be a significant way in which you've chosen to give back. How did you land on how did you land on this project? Yeah. So while I was in the army, I was an engineer, and my job was to help the army collect data. We collected data to help generals make better decisions about the conflict in Iraq. And so I spent two years in Iraq, about a year and uh, some change in Iraq. And we were helping all of these generals make just more, uh, you know, decisions that would drive, um, that would essentially help to reduce the loss of life for American soldiers. And when I left, so naturally when I left the army to study at Georgetown, my research examined how we could do this in communities of color mm -hmm. to drive decision making about public safety right and i just want to talk a bit about what i learned through this process which is probably common knowledge at this point there are 18,000 police departments in the united states and each of them have their own unique process for reporting police misconduct and you might think that, well, Brandon, there are 18,000 of those, uh, of, you know, of the police department. So it makes sense that each of them have their own unique way for processing complaints. Uh, well, this decentralized nature of reporting police conduct really presents two fundamental challenges to reform, right? The first is that the country can't apply best practices, not at scale, because information is locked away in a single police department. 
But the second one, which I think is just more, uh, we should spend more time talking about, is that police officers can move from one department to the next department to the next department without their records ever following them. Yes. And I wonder, is there another profession where that can happen? As a psychologist, I know my license. I couldn't get a license in another state or somewhere, right? Like there would be communication or doctors or lawyers, nurses, teachers, but we have no- All of the people who we, you know, depend on on a daily basis could never do that, right? We could never have, there. there is, I don't know if there is a profession like- that that allows you to go from one place, not just county to county, but department to department, which is, I mean, for me, it was almost mind blowing. And this is due to the collective bargaining agreements between police unions and police departments, yes. which preclude them from sharing information about their previous location. And and it's no and it has been made clear that this is a problem. Timothy Lohman, who was a police officer in Independence, Ohio, some county uh, close to Cleveland, uh, spent some time uh, about six months at the Department of Independence, Ohio, and uh, was fired shortly after. The police chief wrote a scathing memo that basically said this police officer should never be hired, should never have an opportunity to have a gun, and I am really afraid for the well-being of the people he patrols. Timothy Lohman, some days later, shot and killed a 12-year-old boy in the park, Tamir Rice, for holding a toy gun in less than two seconds of him arriving on the scene, right? And had the police chief, had the community, had anyone, <laughs> everyone known, had everyone known about his previous experience that he was not fit to be a police officer, then we could have made a better decision. Tamir Rice could have been alive today. Right. And that's right? what gets me when we talk about police violence. Again, people immediately get defensive and the whole like Blue Lives Matter mm -hmm. and you know, just defending police. And I often, I, I shouldn't have to share, but I do that my father-in-law is a retired state police, mm. you know, lieutenant. Yeah. Uh, I hope I got his your rank life, right. Your life is complicated <laughs> then, right? Well, Kinda? it isn't, it isn't. Okay, yeah. He understands that there's misconduct. Yeah. And our children understand that we're not out to get police as individuals. Your grandpa's a police, right? But, yeah. But we are... We are dealing with a broken system. Yeah. And what gets me is that people only want to talk about individuals and people they know who are good people and refuse to understand, like you're saying, there's no accountability. There's yeah, no accountability I mean, and there's not, not even close. There's not even and there's not a systematized way of reporting misconduct. Yeah. And I, I, I want to be careful in calling it misconduct because one of the things that uh, Daniel Pantaleo, when he strangled Eric Garner, mm -hmm. um, performed a chokehold. That was not classified as That's misconduct. True. That's true. Right? And so I want to be careful in saying misconduct because it is violence or is what it is. misuse of power. Right. Mis yes. Misuse of power. Right. That is much better, yeah. right? Because okay. oftentimes we classify things as being misconduct and that's the jargon and the wording that they want us to use. Mm. But that's not the words we use mm. when things are violent, right? Right. So one of the things that I was, uh, after finding out all of that, um, there's more. I learned that the police officer who killed my partner had a history of being violent when, particularly during traffic stops. Right. And was he killed during a traffic stop? Yes. My partner was shot in the head during a traffic stop. Right. And this police officer had a history of being abusive during uh, traffic stops. And, and so one of the things that I kind of started to investigate is why didn't anyone report the police officer? This right. is, you know. Well, it turns out that many people don't do that. Uh, in fact, in 2013, the Department of Justice released a special report about police activity in 2011, which seems to be the most recent data we have, uh, that, you know, out of the 63 million interactions with police, 93% um, of the time, when people experience police violence, they do not report it, right? 93%. Right? So 93% of about 6 million times mm -hmm. 
that they had classified as negative policing, mm-hmm. do we see? Uh, we, we do not see a reporting of that policing. But I have to add here that part of it is because you end up having to report it to the police. So my partner yes. was treated poorly by the police. Like Literally, he was on his motorcycle driving on the highway. I was behind him in the car, pregnant with our first child. And I am... I see him pulled over. Yeah. In handcuffs. Yeah. They they and long story short, they swore that his bike was stolen. Wow, what's funny is that they swore my partner's car was stolen, but we we paid for we, that car. We had spent 3 or 4 years saving up for that car. And if anyone had reported it stolen, how because we own it. Who it, reported it stolen? Well, we have similar stories. We are, we're also high school sweethearts, oh. and we had paid for that bike in full. He had gone to Canada to get the bike. Yeah. So again, you know, it, this and it was years after he bought it. So it, it was not true. Yeah. And they they were so violent in pulling him off the bike that it almost got dropped, and that, you know, yeah. all of they were just so sure that they. Like, I don't, it's hard to even talk about. Yeah. And wow, I can imagine. Well, I I can't imagine you having to retell your story over and over and the, to find out the details that it maybe could have been avoided if someone had reported it. But I say that to say, we attempted to report it, Uh huh. but we're reporting it you, to the police. You went to the police station. Yeah. Right. Which is the problem, and which is what we found out is that 93% of people don't do it. Why? Well, because they have to go into the police station. That's not all. Most cities in the United States require you not only to go into the police station and file a report about a police officer, but also make you do it between business hours, uh. between nine and five. And within 90 days of it happening, which is nearly impossible for most working people, it just doesn't happen. So. That's where Rahim was born. Five years of military service, collecting data and learning how best to do it. Three years of academic research. And then uh, the single most important person to me being lost is what inspired me to start Rahim. And it's, it's important. F- uh, Rahim is important for a few ways. First, to describe Rahim, it's simple. It's an independent service for reporting police conduct in the United States. When you report to us, we can help facilitate a reporting to the jurisdiction that you live in, or we cannot. We can just have it on our site. But what we created now, and what will be released next week on the, uh, on the 15th of August, on Thursday, you'll be able to see the stories in real time being uploaded by people. You will see the names, you will see the badge numbers of police officers. You will see the departments listed. So wherever a police officer goes, if there is a report about them on Rahim, we know a lot. We as a private organization don't have to, um, we don't live by the guidelines of collective bargaining agreements between police unions and police departments. We will share the names of police officers and police departments. So it really could become a tool for if, if police departments want to know. Yeah. Yes. It could become a tool so for Chiefs them to of, check. So chiefs of police can now use our database for hiring before they hire a police officer. Uh, and hey, if you think that, uh, you know, and oftentimes the next thing that we hear is, oh, well, if you're going to do that, you want to make sure that everything that you're getting is, is truthful uh, and then it's important. And I think we have to strike a balance between each of that, right? Because it can't be so difficult to report your encounter with police that you don't get any information about how to improve policing. Um, and can we just talk about that for a little bit, about improving policing? Because mm. I just use that term, and I should not use mm. that term, because we don't need policing. Well, and so that brings us to this larger conversation, right? Yeah. People talk about abolishing yeah. policing. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give you a good example. I don't th- First, I'll say that I, don't, I, think, I think that abolitionists get a bad rep. Yes. I'm an abolitionist, and abolitionists truly believe in the uh, the incremental and oftentimes not incremental, but because of the way the world works, it most likely will be incremental, removal of police and the need for police to be involved in community work. And so what that basically means is, a, a good example is, um, homelessness. We had one. We had one person, a woman, um, report to Rahim that she was 
um, that she was arrested for uh, disturbing the peace. She was arguing in public with her partner, right? On the street, I think somewhere in Oakland. And we had another man who reported to Rahim. He was arrested and kind of roughed up, but then arrested by a police officer for defecating, for using the bathroom in public. And then a couple reported to us who were experiencing homelessness. Uh, they were having sex outside. Right. And so they were arrested and also, you know, verbally abused and all of that. So these are three things that I don't know about you, but me and my partner do. I argue with my partner. I use the bathroom and I'm intimate with my partner, both physically and emotionally. But guess what? I have a house to do it in. I don't do it outside. It's not because I don't. It's not because, uh, you know, it's not because. Uh, people who are experiencing homelessness or in transition want to disturb the, the peace outside, but they argue with their partner like anyone does. Uh, it's not the fact that they want to use the bathroom outside, but hey, they don't have a house. So the problem can't be solved by putting more police officers to patrol people experiencing homelessness. The problem needs to be solved by giving homeless people homes. That can't be solved by police. But if you continue to create opportunities for greater accountability of police, let's say, for instance, by infusing their budget with money to help buy new body-worn cameras, you might say to yourself, hey, how about, it's great now that when police come to engage us, they have, they have this accountability tool, right? Which actually hasn't panned out to work that well. It's not. But I think that the, 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 the nature of that conversation just needs to shift from let's have greater accountability of police. Sure. I mean, I think that's important. But in and addition to that, we also need to be creating opportunities that, that essentially fix the problem. Because right. the problem can't be continuously quality of life infractions for homeless people. Well, right? it's a matter of looking at the root cause of an issue. I did a ride along with our police here when I was part of a program and of the four interactions that we had when I was doing this ride along, mm. three really needed a social worker, not a police officer. Yeah. Like most times in San Francisco, you have 80% of all the calls that San Francisco police department received last year. And the year before that were for 5150s. Those are uh, calls because a person is experiencing a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and Don't so 80%, right? But we have trained people right. who know exactly what to do but with we and how to help. But we haven't adequately funded them. Like we think about the deinstitutionalization that we did in the 80s. Yeah. We deinstitutionalized, saying we were going to create these community opportunities for people to get mental health support and we never followed through with it yeah. so we now have la jail system cook county and in chicago system those those prisons are the largest mental health units yeah right and so that should tell us something right there is that we are not treating the root cause and yeah. that doesn't i don't think that means that i just want to be clear people often try to correlate mental illness with like criminal you know being criminals or being violent that's not the case. But mm -hmm. what happens is, like you said, we end up over-policing people who really need mental health support. Yeah. And I think that if we give people the support that they need, then we don't have a need for police. Mm -hmm. But that's problematic because what do you do with an entire ecosystem of people who are funded by police? Right. You have Or prisons. Right. You have bells bondsmen or bells bonds people. Whole you have industries. The court systems. You have public defenders. You have... Um, you have private attorneys, yep. you have police officers themselves, you have dispatchers, right? So you have, an, you have created, right? The United States of America has created an entire economy dependent on crime, right? And so is, is reducing crime, in fact, economically viable to continue funding the lives of people in the areas calling the police on black people, uh, calling the police on black people, right? So I think that that's a, that's a fundamental question and a shift and a mindset we really have to think more deeply about. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to realize that as we consider those questions, Raheem and the database that you've created, give us data that, that can help inform where we go next. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a gap. 
Yeah. And that's what I, I want to just highlight that's beautiful is, is the way in which you took personal experience, personal knowledge, uh, uh, academic study, the academic in me loves that, right? Like you put them all together <laughs> yeah. to find this beautiful way to contribute to the problem, yeah. to contribute to potential solution to the yeah. problem. Yeah. And so having that, that database grow, I think is important. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've done a... So we did a pilot last year. Mm -hmm. In the first three months of that pilot, we were able to collect more data than the city had collected. We did the pilot in San Francisco. We collected twice as much data in three months as the city had ever collected in a year. Really? Yeah. Then uh, we got... Uh, we said, okay, this is working. This makes sense. And we launched in, in April. Uh, in our first 100 days, we've helped more than 2,300 people report police in over 200 cities, connecting more than 250 police officers to violent crimes in their community. That's powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. Thank you. I, I wonder, I was looking at the website, and we'll put up there where folks can find out more and yeah. go to the website. Yeah. Uh, you also have on there, you know, people can report being treated well. Yeah. Was that always there or was that from in response to push back to people saying, oh, you're only asking for negative interactions? Yeah, no, this is, this is actually a really good question. It's kind of complicated, right? Because um, I, I want to speak very candidly about the position I'm in right now where I am trying my best to, to I, I am in struggle right now internally um, with how, how can I be an abolitionist? Um, and, and not believe in police, uh, while also working to create a world where I know police will not be abolished tomorrow, right? And, and how can I operate in a world where I don't believe in capitalism, uh, but I don't leave out of the trunk of my car no more? I don't live at 36 and Co. Train. I get paid to do the work that I do. Fortunately enough, I get paid to help people. Um, and so I'm, I'm in deep struggle with how how can I be, um, like how can I be the best version of myself, uh, and 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 still uh, what you know understand I'm not there yet, and I think that that's where the world is when it comes to policing. We have to acknowledge that our north star is a world where police don't exist. It is not to say that police will be abolished tomorrow, but it is to say that like my sister says, um, we have some in the meantime activism, right? Right. And, and so in the meantime, what is important for us to acknowledge is that there are some people who are treated uh, very well by the police. And so who are those people? What, do they, what is it that they have that uh, others do not? And so what we are finding, uh, hopefully what we're going to be able to unearth in that is that there are some people who get the opportunity to experience police in one way and those who get... Uh, <laughs> to experience police in a very different way. And so I'm interested in that phenomenon and, yeah. and how that is shifted based on where you live, based on what you drive, based on what color your skin is, right. based on your ability to move throughout the world freely. You have developed a really robust tool. I mean, in statistics speak, right? Like those are moderators. Those are variables that influence the when, the who, the for whom, the how, and can really help us understand like you said, the variables that, that dictate who gets to experience the brunt and who gets to experience mm. the joy yeah. of being protected. Yeah. Ooh, we could talk about a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really appreciate you joining us. If folks want to know more about Raheem, more about you, how would you like them to follow? Yeah, two things. One, go to the website, Raheem.org. Raheem is spelled R-A-H-E-E-M. It's Arabic for a second chance. Mm. The second one is to join our digital police monitoring group. We have more than 150 people across the country. The job is super easy, and I'll tell you how you can join. Text JOIN, J-O-I-N, to 415-610-4911, and you'll be a part of our digital, monitoring, digital police monitoring group. The job's super easy. We send you a text every three months, four times a year. We ask you a simple question. Have you experienced police in the last few months? If no, cool, we'll text you again in another three months. If so, 
you create a you, your information and your encounter with police help us to track how often people are policed in your community, helping us to build a more robust system and tool for that. So Raheem.org, if you just want to check us out and submit a report, definitely want to hear about the most recent experience with police that you've had. Um, if you have the ticket and the name and badge number of the police officer, even better. If you don't, it's completely okay. You can put as much information there as you can. Uh, and the second is text JOIN to 415-610-4911 to be a part of our digital police monitoring group. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's been great. And thank you all for joining me on Raising Equity, where, you know, our, our long game is how we can raise people, young people who understand systems. And so I know I learned a lot today just hearing Brandon talk about the different ways in which policing can impact folks' lives. And, and that's something you can share with the young people in your life, with each other as adults even, right? Like for us to understand how these systems operate so that we can move forward towards solutions. We don't have to get caught up in the individual's bad apple in a barrel argument that we can understand the systemic nature of police violence, especially as we commemorate the life of Michael Brown Jr. with the fifth anniversary of his death. We can honor him by tackling the issue of police violence rather than denying that it exists. So thanks again. Join us next time on Raising Equity.